Tonight, fires rage in California. In the north and the south with 25 million at risk. With winds expected to hit a dangerous peak and fan those flames, is this the new normal? We've made mistakes. Boeing CEO faces anger and accusations over the deadly Max 8 crashes. Handcuffed and under arrest, how did a suspect get a gun inside a Toronto police cruiser? Oh, look at Buddy Boy in the right. He's got his cell phone right up to him. And distracted driving is becoming more deadly than drunk driving, and we're all paying the price. This is The National. These are firefighters plunging into the heat and fury of the largest fire now raging in California. Fires are burning out of control in the south and the north. It's a state under siege, and with extreme winds in the forecast, there are fears the worst is yet to come. Oh, my God. Oh, I need to get out of here. Oh, my God. More than 200,000 people have been told to run. More than 120 structures are already gone. More than 1.5 million frustrated customers are without electricity as the utility tries to keep downed power lines from sparking new fires. North of San Francisco, the largest fire, Kincaid, has been burning for almost a week. It is maybe 15% contained. And then in the south, around L.A., more fires, including the Getty Fire, which we learned tonight started yesterday thanks to a power line brought down by a tree in high winds. And it is only going to get worse. Across the state, these areas covering about 25 million people are under so-called red flag warnings, meaning they face fierce dry winds expected to supercharge the fires. In the north, fire has already left behind the widest path of destruction. And Aaron Collins is seeing it firsthand. All along Chalk Hill Road, the Kincaid Fire has left its mark. Dozens of homes gone, thousands of people evacuated from them, but some stayed. I'd say 99% of the people I know were about ready to come up here and rip me off the mountain. Eric Sampietro manages this 2,000 acre ranch. When the fire rolled in, he dug in, using what he learned fighting fires here two years ago to fight back now. I learned that you should probably keep a gun on you because people are going to come try to take your stuff if you're not there. And I learned that fire is very serious. It's nothing to play with. But if you understand it, you can combat it. San Pietro saved much of this ranch. But just down the road, others weren't so lucky. The animals are fine here amidst the lingering smoke. The homes aren't. We discovered that uh, two out of the three buildings on the property are completely gone. And uh, the cattle's safe, which is great. Um, and then most of the property is just destroyed. The winds that whipped across this valley are picking up again today, stoking flames that have so many out of their homes and so many homes here reduced to ash, including the one right next to the ranch Eric San Pietro runs. Still, he plans to stay. If you're in the black, which is everything that's been burnt, it can't burn again. So now you're safe. As bad and as scary as it sounds, sometimes the best place to be is in the belly of the beast. So Aaron, you're in Sonoma Valley, uh, pretty close to the front line of that Kincaid fire. A couple thoughts. What are people bracing for? And specifically, what's actually happening behind you there? Yeah, well, it's all really about the wind here. For those firefighters behind me that are here putting out hotspots and for the folks that are evacuated from this part of Northern California, there's forecasts for 110 kilometer per hour winds through this part of the world and 130 kilometer per hour through the southern part of the, of the state near Los Angeles. So those winds will be kicking up hotspots like this and fires like the Kincaid fire that are burning right across the state. That's what people are worrying about. That's what's pe keeping people up at night today. All right, Aaron, thanks very much. So later in the hour, we will go in depth on these fires. Each year, the flames get more fierce, the devastation more widespread. So is this the new normal? How can we adapt? That's in about 20 minutes. Well, in Washington today, in front of families who've lost loved ones, the CEO of Boeing was grilled about those deadly 737 MAX plane crashes. Exactly one year ago, a Lion Air flight crashed after takeoff. Months later, another fatal flight in Ethiopia. 18 Canadians on board. 
As Susan Ormiston tells us, U.S. senators demanded answers for the 346 people killed. They are silenced voices. Once travelers Angela Rahorn, Daniel Moore, just 24, their families here to hold a man and his company accountable for failure. CEO Dennis Mullenberg doesn't look at them as he arrives to meet tough questions on Boeing's tattered safety record, but first to apologize. We are sorry, deeply and truly sorry. I'm heartbroken by your losses. I think about you and your loved ones every day. We will never forget. You could please stand so we could thank to you all. To press that thank point, Senator Richard Blumenthal calls on families to stand up before heaping blame on Boeing for not one but two catastrophic crashes. Not only preventable, but was the result of a pattern of deliberate concealment. Those pilots never had a chance. They were in flying coffins. At issue, what did Boeing know, when and why didn't it ground the MAX 8 aircraft after the first crash in Indonesia? I think about that decision over and over every day. We've learned from the second accident, and if we could go back, we would have made a different decision. But he doesn't explain how problems with MCAS, the flight control system, weren't fixed sooner. Back in 2016, Boeing's chief engineer in text messages described MCAS as running rampant in simulator testing. How did your team not put it in front of you, run in with their hair on fire, saying, we got a real problem here? Mullenberg admits Boeing made mistakes with MCAS they're fixing now. Too late for Paul and Jirogi's family, all five of them. I'll always live uh, knowing that. Uh, the decisions that they made before and after the first crash uh, caused the deaths of my family. Mullenberg should be forced out, say some family, and later he met with them privately, but Boeing can't give them what they want. He robbed Daniel away from us. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Now, Boeing's 737 MAX series planes are still banned from flying worldwide. They were grounded in March after the second crash. Boeing hopes the Federal Aviation Administration will allow MAX jets to fly again by the end of the year, but the FAA is also being criticized for relying on Boeing staff to perform some of the certification tests and inspections that would allow the planes back in the air. Also on Capitol Hill today, but behind closed doors, more testimony in the Trump impeachment inquiry, the first from a current White House official. As Paul Hunter explains, the testimony is about to get a lot more public. Arriving on Capitol Hill in full military uniform, Alex Vindman, U.S. National Security Council official with the White House, was set for perhaps the most significant testimony yet in the Donald Trump impeachment inquiry. Vindman called it his sacred duty. After all, he was in on that infamous phone call. The one in July between Trump and Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky that effectively set the stage for what's playing out now. Vindman's testimony was behind closed doors today, but in his opening statement, he said, I was concerned by the call. I did not think it was proper for Trump to do what he did, and that he was so worried it would undermine U.S. national security, Vindman reported all of it to government lawyers, echoing concerns later raised separately by whistleblower. The broad allegation that in that call, Trump abused the power of the presidency by trying to press Zelensky to investigate Trump rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter for personal political gain. As Trump spoke with Zelensky, Vindman was in the Situation Room, listening in, along with other senior administration officials. Now he's the first person who actually heard the call to testify before lawmakers seeking to impeach the president. But even before Vindman told his story today, Trump slammed him, tweeting, how many more never-Trumpers will be allowed to testify about a perfectly appropriate phone call, he wrote, adding, as he said before, I knew people were listening in. Why would I say something inappropriate? So, Paul, you talked about how today's testimony was behind closed doors, but I gather that's about to change, right? 
Hey, Adrian. Uh, yeah, look, Democrats drafted a resolution today for a vote, likely Thursday, that would send the inquiry into a public phase, if it passes. And it almost certainly will. It would mean depositions already given privately will be made public. Future witnesses will testify out in the open. And Republicans will have greater powers to question witnesses and subpoena evidence of their own. In theory, Americans will get the full story for the first time as Democrats work toward the next step, the big vote on articles of impeachment. Maybe, goes the thinking, by Christmas time, which, if it passes, would then send everything to the Senate for trial. So, it's about to get a lot more interesting and fast with the Trump presidency itself, Adrian, in the balance. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Paul. In Toronto tonight, a public library branch became a battleground for opposing views on transgender rights and whether they conflict with women's rights. A controversial feminist from Vancouver was invited to speak at a group sold out event, but outside, protesters slammed her as transphobic. Ellen Morrow gives us both sides. A group of protesters stormed the library where Megan Murphy spoke tonight. The culmination of weeks of outrage at the Toronto Public Library for allowing Murphy a platform. Our rights are no debate! Passions boiled over. Protesters confronted people coming out of Murphy's appearance. I am against this and I am here to support my fellow LGBT members. Murphy argues it's wrong to let someone born male have access to female-only facilities, even if they are transgender. I'm really concerned at the way that women are expected to sacrifice their safety and their rights to accommodate a tiny minority. It dehumanizes us. Nico Stratus, a transgender woman, says Murphy is fueling hate. So it's people telling you that the wolves are at the door, and then all these people are expecting us to all be you know, predators and dangerous before we're, we're all just people that are just trying to live our lives. The library has faced serious backlash for allowing tonight's event to go ahead, including from Toronto Mayor John Tory. In a public building, we have an obligation to set a higher standard, and that's why I'm disappointed in this decision. Critics point to the library's policy, where it reserves the right to cancel a booking likely to promote or would have the effect of promoting discrimination, contempt or hate on the basis of gender identity. Uh, the city's top librarian uh, says Murphy's rhetoric doesn't reach that bar. I mean, what we're seeing in the world is more and more uh, people shutting down free speech. What it does is you're uh, censoring ideas, you're shutting down controversy. And in a democratic society, that's how uh, we, d we come to uh, a better understanding of each other. But Stratus says the cost is too great. It's like when people talk about bears, they're more scared of you than you are of them. I'm scared of everybody because you never know what somebody's going to be like. Mm -hmm. And it just takes one to stir it up. Stirred up tonight, high emotions and the perennial debate over free speech versus hate speech. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. And more sharp questions in Toronto tonight, but this time for police over a shocking incident caught on video in the back of a patrol car. This is a situation that could have turned deadly for the officers in the front seat if the suspect had managed to keep a grip on his secret gun. Ali Chiesson explains. It was otherwise a routine impaired driving arrest. 38-year-old Ali Shobeg is in the back of a police cruiser after being patted down and cuffed en route to a police station after being found allegedly drunk behind the wheel of his car. And then this happens. He's got a gun, a semi-automatic pistol. He shimmies it to his knees. We could have police officers shot. We could have members of the public shot. It's a very disturbing video. The video sent shockwaves through city law enforcement, prompting internal investigations looking at two things. Why wasn't this detected during the search? And the other investigation is to how did this video get leaked? So we'll let those investigations take uh, place. But in the meantime, we're more concerned with somebody being in the back of a police car with a gun on them. It's, it's very disturbing. The officers only found out about the gun after hearing it fall to the floor with a thud. They pulled over and seized it. Shobeg now faces nine criminal charges, including eight firearms charges. You don't want to think that somebody who's inside a police car or anywhere else for that matter has a gun, especially after they've been searched. 
Shobeg has a history with guns, stemming from his connection to a 2005 shooting outside of a Toronto no-frills when he was 23 years old. Attempted murder charges were later dropped, but he was sentenced to three years for possession of a loaded firearm with a court-ordered lifetime firearm ban. Fast forward 14 years and he's in the back of a cruiser again, this time with a gun. Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders said today he'll be looking at whether the matter will be dealt with through training or disciplinary action. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Let's take you to Britain now, where an inquiry into the Grenfell Tower fire is slamming the London Fire Brigade. It says the department was poorly prepared to deal with the inferno and made mistakes that proved deadly. 72 people were killed when the apartment building became engulfed in flames two years ago. Renee Filipponi brings us some leaked details of the report. Oh my God, they're screaming! It started on the fourth floor, a simple electrical failure in a fridge. But grew rapidly through the night, consuming nearly all 23 stories. The inquiry into what happened has taken about a year and a half. Grieving families have been told they can't talk about the report until it's public, but they can share their stories. Very hard, very hard. Nabil Shakir lost six relatives. I believe a lot of uh, families could have been rescued uh, without a doubt. The report, parts of which have been leaked to the UK media, praises the extraordinary courage of the firefighters, but says there were systemic failures, that preparation and training for this type of fire was gravely inadequate, pointing specifically to a stay-put decision, which kept some people in their homes while the fire spread. Hamid al-Jafari's father died. He's still searching for answers. I don't know the meaning of justice. I don't know, it's now more than two years. We're kind of like a leftovers. We don't know like what's happening. The London Fire Brigade won't comment until tomorrow, but the National Fire Chiefs Council is defending its members, saying the inquiry is being handled back to front. It does feel at times that 20 years of building regulation failure is being laid at the feet of the Fire and Rescue Service. Tomorrow's report is just phase one of the inquiry, dealing specifically with the emergency response. Phase two will look at the building's design and the highly flammable cladding that fed the deadly fire all night long. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. More news still ahead on The National. And here's a question. How much exercise are you getting? Canadian adults are mostly getting a failing grade. Is your neighborhood to blame? Plus, a controversial fix to a deadly stretch of highway in Regina, rerouting Trans-Canada traffic just ahead. And Quebec changes its pot laws. The province now has the strictest rules in the country. We'll explain next. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. If you're heading east or west along the Trans-Canada Highway, there's a new route you can take through Saskatchewan's capital. The $1.8 billion Regina Bypass officially opened to traffic today. And as Bonnie Allen tells us, it, ex it is expected to save time and save lives as well. Until late today, heavy trucks had no choice but to drive through the city of Regina. Bumper to bumper traffic and the lights. It's a pain in the ass. People are constantly pulling pull in front of you, hitting the brakes. The Trans-Canada Highway cutting through Regina was the only option. But now the Regina Bypass provides an alternate route to divert traffic from all directions away from the city. It includes 12 overpasses and 40 kilometres of four-lane highway. It's expected to speed up the movement of goods and ease congestion on city streets. The bypass has been mired in controversy with criticisms over where it's located and how the province purchased and even expropriated land to clear a path for it. But the biggest impact for certain for all of us and for our families that travel will be in the area of safety. The Regina bypass will save lives. As the population grew on Regina's east end, it became increasingly difficult and dangerous for people to merge onto the busy Trans-Canada Highway. Wanda Campbell's 17-year-old son Lane died doing just that. There was a trail of crosses, a trail of heartbreak and broken lives, 
connected with this part of the highway and something needed to be done. Before the bypass, I was on a first name basis with the coroner's office. Randy Schultz is a fire chief east of Regina. We're asked and the fire service to go out and meet people in their darkest moments and go help. And uh, it is tough. He says early phases of the bypass already in use have cut collisions in half. In a ceremony yesterday, the premier, a former farmer who holds a semi-license, drove the first transport truck on the bypass. Now open to all, it's expected 21,000 drivers will use the bypass each day. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. And let's get to Ian now in our Vancouver National Newsroom where he's watching developing stories for us. And let's begin in Winnipeg, Andrew, where police have charged two teenagers in connection to the stabbing death of a 14-year-old over the weekend. Police were called to a Halloween party after a fight got out of hand, leaving two girls with stab wounds. An 18-year-old survived, but the 14-year-old died of her injuries. This was part of a violent weekend that saw the number of homicides in Winnipeg rise to 36 this year, the second highest on record. After last week's election, two federal parties are seeking recounts in ridings where just a few hundred votes separated the top two candidates. The Bloc Québécois is looking at two ridings, Hochelaga in Montreal and another in Quebec City. In both, the Liberal candidates won by a little over 300 votes over the Bloc candidate. And in British Columbia, the NDP has requested a recount in Port Moody Coquitlam near Vancouver, where a Conservative candidate beat out the new Democrat challenger by just 153 votes. Starting January 1st, Quebec will have the toughest cannabis laws in the country. The province's CAQ government passed its cannabis bill this afternoon. The new law raises the age limit to 21 from 18. Well, we want to, show, we want to send a clear message that we want to protect the most vulnerable uh, people to the effect of these toxic products. The law also bans the sale of cannabis candies and desserts, even as edibles are set to become legal in the rest of the country. How would you feel about a national election in mid-December? That's what the UK is getting set for, and it's one of the stories we'll have for you when I'm back in 20 minutes. All right, next on The National, we go in-depth on those wildfires raging in California. Is this the new normal? Nick Purden takes us to the Getty Fire. We hear from Canadians living through it and what one wildfire expert says we need to do to adapt. Every year now, wildfires everywhere seem to cause more destruction and sometimes death. Well, tonight, the National goes in-depth on the reality facing California right now. Is this, as officials have described it, the new normal? In the Los Angeles area, desert winds of 60 miles an hour are driving brush fires through canyons and hills. Does this sound familiar? Savage brush fires in California have forced thousands of people to flee their homes. California has been fighting wildfires for generations. Wherever the fire went, there was a path of destruction. But over the years, the fire season has just become longer, the devastation undeniably worse. If you would have told me five years ago that in December you're going to be on a fire where you see a thousand homes destroyed right before Christmas, I would have said you're crazy. Of the top ten most destructive fires in California's history, six happened in just the past two years. The most destructive, last year's camp fire, was also the deadliest, killing 85 people. I didn't want to look at the list in case I knew somebody. I can't, I can't do it. I just can't. Fire is normal. It's just the scale of the threat that's new. The fire was in command, and these folks were just reacting. They were not in charge of the fire, just the opposite of what we used to see in the old days. Climate change is certainly part of it, but also trends in forestry management and urban development. A third of Californian homes are built close to dense vegetation, definitely in harm's way. And when the fire comes, it's shocking how fast it can transform neighborhoods to apocalyptic avenues of ash. That is what the Getty Fire did to a part of western L.A. in just hours. So here's a glimpse of the aftermath from Nick Purton. This is a neighborhood in Los Angeles where what they're calling the Getty Fire, it swept through here. As you can see, this house, that was a front door, gone. House burned to the ground. If you look up here, 
1128. This is 1128 Tiger Tail Road, someone's home, gone. Over here, you know, open the mailbox, you look inside, and the letters are incinerated, just ash today. The other thing that strikes you as you walk up and down is people are getting ready for Halloween, and now they don't know what's going to happen next in their lives and when they'll be able to return. People like Peter Locke and Nola Highland. Bayless Road, which runs off of Westridge. They spent the last two nights at this evacuation center. Peter tells me he's worried about his house. I keep dialing my home number and I get the answering machine so I know the house hasn't burned down. In the moment where you were evacuated, what did you, you think about? Just getting out, just scared, you know. Tell me what happened. When I left, the flames, where you could see the flames, they were way up in the air. Uh, looked like they were maybe a couple of miles away. But uh, there was a lot of uh, dust and smoke in the air. It was hard, a little hard to breathe. And uh, I've been there 50 years in the house, and I've never seen it get this close before. You know, this is the worst that it's ever been. In that moment, what did you think about it when you saw the flames? Uh, I got to get out of here. You know, I, 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 I really thought, I can't leave my house. I'll stay here. And I always thought I'll stay here with a hose if my house catches on fire. But when I saw the flames, <laughs> <laughs> I changed my mind in a minute, you know. Nola Highland is 90, and she tells me she's found a silver lining in all of this. I'm happy to be here. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the help I've received and the fact that everything is going well and the city has been, I guess, practicing for situations like this because I have no complaints, no problems. It's, it's very rewarding to see what the city has done for us here. Well, Nola and Peter are becoming friends because of the fire, but I can't help but wonder what's waiting for them when they get home. Nick Purden, CBC News, Los Angeles. We reached a Canadian woman who lives in Windsor, California, with her husband and her six-year-old daughter. They fled their home and took refuge with friends until that home also had to be evacuated. Now, when we spoke with Cassandra Parsons, that phone connection was a little bit patchy. I feel like it wasn't something that we could even really process right away. As soon as it was almost unbelievable at first that so we got the message and I, I kind of panicked initially and I said, okay, we have to leave. Um, and it just happened really, really quickly. It was emotional, but our main concern was making sure that we were going to be evacuating as a family and that we ha just grabbed what was necessary. And it was hard more so for my daughter. We evacuated um, to our friend's house and it was um, already a long day and we didn't get much sleep and so we were kind of all awake and around four o'clock in the morning we got the uh, Nixel report to evacuate from their location. As we we're evacuating the um, planes started to go over our house which are the fire retarded planes. All the sirens that were pulling into our town as well. You could hear them, helicopters. I, I, I'm pretty positive our home's safe. And um, tonight is kind of, so we're told is kind of like the final night for Windsor. So after um, the winds, I think our home will be pretty safe from here on. Um, it's been pretty emotional to see uh, the firefighters going into areas that you are so familiar with. It's shocking to see your town look like a war zone. It, that's, I think, what hit hard is seeing the streets bare and everything looks blackened and the smoke heavy in the wind. And it's, it's definitely difficult to watch. We've been hearing from our family and friends back home in Canada. It's been so amazing to see how many people have reached out to us just to make sure that we're okay and um, if we need anywhere to go. So it was very touching. Year after year of mega fires, is this the future? The prospect that it is has experts across all industries putting their heads together from fire prevention to insurance to utilities to construction, government. There is a Canadian who stands where all that intersects. He is Ed Struzik, author of Firestorm, How Wildfire Will Shape Our Future. And this spring, when concerned Californians hosted a summit of thinkers about how to handle what is coming, it was Struzik they asked to speak. So, Ed, thank you very much for joining us. We keep hearing this phrase, uh, the new normal. Is that actually the right phrase for what's happening? 
No, there's nothing normal about what we're seeing on the landscape. I'd like to prefer to call it the new reality. And that new reality is bigger, hotter fires that are burning in more unpredictable ways. Uh, and we just got to grapple with that. Bigger, hotter, I, I think we all get that. But, but how else uh, is the behavior of fires changing specifically? Well, we're seeing fires, uh, for example, in Fort McMurray, there was a pyro CB, which is essentially a uh, fire that creates its own thunderstorm uh, that shot out lightning 32 kilometers in advance of the fire and, and, and uh, uh, ignited a cluster of fires that far away, 32 kilometers away. No one had ever seen anything quite like that. We're also seeing uh, slow-moving thunderstorms going across the boreal forest, for example, one in Alaska that shot out 62,000 lightning strikes and triggered 284 fires. We've never seen anything like that. So this is really a game changer now for firefighters on the ground. When we look at what's been happening in California, as well as you know the examples of, of, of Canada you just mentioned, is there a connection between the two? How much of this can fairly be attributed not just to sort of more densely populated uh, populations in, in areas where there are trees, but to climate change? Oh, quite a bit. I mean, with climate change, uh, you've got a drier forest, drier grasslands, so a lot more to ignite on the landscape. Uh, and California is a little bit different because 95% of the fires are started by humans, and so they're es essentially preventable. Here in Canada, it's quite a bit different because a third of our big fires are started by lightning. Uh, depending on where you are in the country. So with every one degree increase in temperature, you get about 12% more lightning and 12% more lightning strikes potentially. So that's a big concern. So Ed, when I hear you speak, you, you, you talk about uh, fires the way some people talk about learning to live with flooding, adapting to it. So if we apply that, how do you learn how to live with fires? How do you adapt? Well, for one thing, we've got to stop building wood houses with cedar shake shingles and ornamental cedars uh, built around uh, wood fences around our house because they're essentially just fuel for fire. Uh, we've got to learn how, how to do what a lot of First Nations communities are doing right across the country now, is starting to consider uh, where they live and thinning the forest. Uh, uh, we've got to do more prescribed burning, I think, uh, in our national parks and in vulnerable communities in the boreal forest. We're just not, we're doing some of this, but we're not doing it fast enough. All right, Ed, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, that was Ed Struzik, author and forest fire expert, joining us from Edmonton tonight. More on the fires ahead in our moment. The story of one wedding photographer, one couple, and a spark of inspiration. There's one for the photo album. The full story coming up. But next, cracking down on distracted driving. It is killing Canadians. How some cops are trying to drive that message home. That, that We're back into. All across Canada, police say distracted driving is getting worse. That's despite stiffer penalties and aggressive awareness campaigns. A national survey recently found that the vast majority of Canadians know it's a problem, yet the number of those who admit doing it is going up. Diane Buckner explains how police and insurance companies are joining forces to push back. Yeah, she had something in her hand. She was swaying on her way up. Ed Joustra of the Ontario Provincial Police and his colleague Kevin McAllister are in an unmarked vehicle on the lookout for distracted drivers. Oh, oh look at Buddy Boy in the right. He's got his cell phone right oh, yeah. up to right him. Behind right behind us in lane three. The right behind us. Look at him swaying. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Totally oblivious. McAllister gets pictures for use later in court. Look, look, he's way over the rumble strip. He doesn't even care. Did you get the shot? I got, yeah, I got one shot. Yep, you are behind the correct vehicle. We just passed you. Two cruisers are ahead of them, ready to intercept the vehicles they spot. Vehicle stopped, Highway 401. Ontario it's Marshall. a $615 fine. Fines are increased, they're adding more penalties, suspensions, and people are still on their phones. The Traffic Injury Research Foundation says in some jurisdictions, there are now more fatalities caused by distracted driving than by impaired driving. Hi everyone, my name's Karen. I am the founder of what's called the Drop It and Drive program. That's one reason the Cooperators Insurance Company is sponsoring sessions like this one for grade school students. How many of you are driven around by a distracted parent? Insurers and educators want to encourage kids to speak up to their parents on the issue. 
And what it does is it provides instant feedback on your driving behaviors. Lisa so, Guglietti of the cooperators example, says distracted example, driving is pushing up everyone's insurance for, premiums. Distracted driving is contributing in some way, although we can't pinpoint the number, to the number of collisions that we're seeing. And as a result, the cost of the pool is going up, and therefore the premiums are going up as well. Excellent. All right, Mr. Doster, don't be too hard on me. The OPP's Ed Joustra gets financial help from a local insurance company for this, another strategy in his mission against distracted driving. There you go, let's see. Oh, oh. there it is. There is an accident already. He goes out to high schools with a oh. driving simulator. So that's that start telling you about uh, distracted driving. Um, that that it's extremely dangerous. Yes. But is the corporate support enough to make a difference? I don't think there's ever going to be enough. Unfortunately, right now, especially the perception, we have a lot of individuals that think they they're fine to drive with a phone in their hand. Right there, hold it there. His advice, put phones out of reach while driving to prevent injury or death and to help put the brakes on rising insurance premiums. Sergeant Toms, you are behind the correct vehicle. And lean Diane Buckner, CBC News, Coburg, Ontario. Ian is next with a look at stories developing around the world tonight. But first... In case you missed it, the town of Georgina, Ontario is racing against time Put on a festive glow. It spent nearly $70,000 on state-of-the-art LED Christmas lights to spruce up business areas. The problem is there's nowhere to plug them in on these outdated lampposts. You have to have a, a code compliant uh, electrical connection just like you would have like on your uh, patio porch. And that is going to cost another $30,000. The thing is, Georgina has been home to both humorous Stephen Leacock and funny man Jim Carrey, either one of them might have had some fun with this mix-up. We need 25 days of work essentially, probably two to three weeks before they're actually started work, but they'll be started in November. That's gonna be a challenge. That's not much time. Are you worried? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we don't move too quickly here. It's gonna be right down to the to the, the wire up and tuck, but we're, we're hoping to get as many as we can up prior to Christmas. We can hope, we can hope that There's they get it done. always hope. I'd love to see it. Yeah. But I don't know how fast things will work around here. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, after many months away, Doug Ford is back in the public eye, and in a bid to turn around his dismal approval rating, he's striking a new tone. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to our national newsroom in Vancouver. After nearly two weeks of anti-government protests, Lebanon's Prime Minister is resigning. In a televised address, Saad Hariri said he's tried to resolve the crisis but admitted he's reached a dead end. The announcement came shortly after a protest camp in Beirut was attacked by Hezbollah supporters. But protesters insist they will not be deterred. As night fell, they were back on the streets demanding a new government. Similar protests in Iraq have taken another deadly turn today. Masked gunmen attack demonstrators in the holy city of Karbala. There are reports of up to 18 people shot dead by security forces and hundreds of others injured. Officials, however, have denied anyone was killed. Iraq's prime minister is under growing pressure to resign. The unrest that started on October 1st has left at least 250 people dead. Voters in the UK will go to the polls this winter in a new bid by the Prime Minister to try to end that Brexit deadlock. The eyes to the right, 438. The nose to the left, 20. So the eyes have it. MPs voted in favour of a snap election for December the 12th. The Prime Minister hopes a new mandate will increase his support in the House and break that stalemate that has so far halted Britain's plan to leave the European Union. The election bill still has to be approved by the House of Lords, but it could become law by the end of the week. Saudi Arabia is $3.4 billion behind on its payments for Canadian light armoured vehicles. Those payments are part of a controversial deal signed under the Conservative government, upheld by the Liberals, to supply the Saudis with hundreds of combat vehicles used to move troops and heavy weapons on the battlefield. New financial results show the Saudi late payment debt has been growing by $200 million every quarter since the beginning of the year. 
Next on The National, lots of adults have good intentions when it comes to working out, but according to a new report, not enough of us are actually doing it. So, some easy ways to get moving next. We're back in two. Well, here's some news you're not going to like. Canadian adults get a failing grade when it comes to physical activity. In its first ever report card on adult fitness, participation found more than three quarters are sedentary for more than eight hours a day. And as health reporter Vicka Dopia explains, changing that behavior will not be easy. Andy Wong is doing what a lot of us have at least thought about. Slipping away from our desk for a lunch workout. It's the only way the digital marketer says he can find the time. After the hour-long commute home, he's just too beat. I would spend a lot more time at the gym, but not doing productive exercises, more lounging around making excuses for myself before I did my next exercise. According to Participation's report card, when it comes to intentions, Canadians get a B plus. Most of us plan to get more physically active. For daily movement alone, such as walking, we get a C. But up the physical activity to moderate or rigorous, and we score an F. Only 16% of us hit the mark. It's no mystery why we don't move as much. Most of us spend half our waking day sitting, and that has serious health risks. So type 2 diabetes, heart disease... Um, hypertension or high blood pressure. So if Canadians want to be more active, why aren't they? Vanderloo says it's a common trap to set goals that are too ambitious. And the minute you find yourself missing those gym appointments, you're going to start to feel defeated, you're going to feel discouraged, and you're probably just going to abandon it altogether. Another factor that discourages movement is our urban environment. Some cities are trying to get us out of our cars by encouraging walking, transit and cycling. But not all cities are designed to make that transition. The average neighborhood takes 75 to 100 years to sort of regenerate or change itself. Uh, so unless we are going in and completely restructuring our communities, our cities, uh, that is a near impossible task. Participation says there are small ways we can get moving. Stand more at the office, walk more. If you drive, park farther away or better yet, Take your bike. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Next on the National, a Californian wedding photo that certainly makes a statement. The photographer behind the new American Gothic. That's next in our moment. The images coming out of the California wildfires are devastating. They're arresting as flames consume parts of that state. But over the weekend, a different kind of fire image went viral. A wedding picture taken with the backdrop of the Kincaid fire. The story behind that shot is our moment of the day. The moment Katie and Curtis put the masks on, I instantly thought of the 1930s painting American Gothic. And American Gothic was showing the, the very average normal of what was happening in the United States at the time. And... I looked at them and I thought, wow, is this the new normal for Sonoma County in 2019? I think it's an interesting mix of both the joy that comes with a wedding day and a sorrow that comes with a traumatic event such as a major wildfire. It, it somehow is all in the same image with the dramatic sky and the red sun, um, the gorgeous couple, the beautiful vineyard. I've lived in California for most of my life, and I, I just remember that, you know, growing up, maybe every 10 years, there would be a dramatic flood. And once every 10 or 20 years, there would be a dramatic fire. Two years ago, there was a very dramatic fire that came through as well, and three of the weddings that I was to photograph were relocated. I hate that this could potentially be the new normal. It's, it's very scary. And it is, and that picture, I think we were just talking about it, it is disturbing. They didn't, they didn't go there to have that picture taken. That is where their wedding was, was supposed to happen. And I, I guess the air quality was so poor, what was supposed to be an outdoor wedding was only about sort of 20 minutes outside, and then they had to move inside. Yeah, of all the unexpected things to have to deal with on a wedding day, right? You plan for a lot of things. You plan for rain, you plan for late <laughs> contractors, you plan for all sorts of problems to come up. Uh, wildfires, maybe not one of those things. 
And so is that kind of a gag attempt to go viral with a picture? Is it art? I mean, the colors, just as the photographer said, are beautiful, and we all want the perfect wedding picture, don't we? And uh, that's going to be a talker for a long, long time, and it's kind of like art. It's in the eye of the beholder. People decide how they feel about the picture. Either way, it's our moment, darn it. <laughs> and that is The National for October 29th. Good night. Good night. Good night.